God, you're so worthy. We lift up your name, Jesus, the name that's above every name. You're worthy of it all. There is no one like you. God, we're completely yours this morning. We thank you for your presence. Come on, let this. It was my cross, so I could in the freedom you died.
Come on, church. Let's sing it again. Lift your voices to him. It's worthy. Church, do you believe that he is worthy this morning? Come on, has he been good to us? Has he been faithful? I want to encourage you. We're going to sing this chorus one more time. And I just think, I picture, I picture God sitting up in heaven and hearing FCF Church, the voices of his sons and daughter, just worshiping it. It's a sweet sound in his ear. Amen. Come on, let's sing one more time. Worthy is. And worthy is your name. Lift your voices. Sing it out. Beautiful. ourselves. And I couldn't be more excited this morning to announce that we are sending our first missions trip back to the DR since COVID. Isn't that fantastic? So I'm going to invite that team to the platform. Also going to invite Pastor Chris. You can be seated. You can remain in an attitude of worship. Pastor Chris is our outreach pastor. Would you let her know how much you love her, how awesome she is? She's going to tell you a little bit about this team. This team that's coming up on stage, like Pastor Pete said, it's the first time that we are heading back to the Dominican after COVID, and they are going to a town called Arbacoa in the northern part of the country, and they are going to be building a brand new church. Now, some of you might notice these folks in the front here, they have on Dominican shirts as well, but on the back of their shirt, it says Prayer Warrior. Each of our team up here chose two special people that have been praying over them, praying for the people in Arbacoa, praying over the mission, and we're going to have that chance to pray for this team as well today. Would you actually go ahead and just stick your hands out, little antennas towards this group here, just as a sign of support. Heavenly Father, right now, we lift up this team for you to you. God, we pray for protection and guidance. We pray for God-ordained moments. God, as they build this church, we know that the gospel will go forward and lives will be changed by your word. We thank you, God. Pray your protection over them. It's in Jesus' name. And in one loud FCF voice, we all said, Amen. 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 Why don't you give a high five to somebody worshiping with you? Say, man, I'm glad I got to sit by you. It's going to be a great day. That ice cream was delish. Good morning, FCF. Yeah, we are excited this morning. It is an awesome Sunday. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning, especially if it is your first time. If it's your first time, we'd love to welcome you. Can we welcome our first time guests? We are thrilled that you chose to spend your Sunday here with us, whether in person or online. We would love to get to know you a little bit better. If you would take a minute and fill out the Connect card, either on the program you got when you came in or on fcfchurch.com slash connect. Uh, just tap connect and then we can get to know you just a little bit better. Now we have a couple things going on. And the first is that next Sunday, we have an information meeting for a fantastic ministry that is, I believe, one of the fastest growing ministries here at FCF Church. It is the homeschool ministry. Yeah. I was even a product of homeschool myself. Don't let that dissuade you. It's okay. 
We, uh, the homeschool ministry is amazing. It has been growing like crazy. And we would love to give you more information about it if you are interested for this upcoming year. If you're definitely like, I want to be a part of it, or even if you just want to learn a little bit more about it, next Sunday after second service in the auditorium right here, we are hosting an information meeting. We're going to give you everything you need to know about it. The only thing, if you want to be there, if you need child care, we need you to register and let us know if you could sign up for child care at fcfchurch.com slash events and let us know and then come on and get lots of info on the FCF homeschool ministry. And then one more thing is that this Sunday is ice cream Sunday. Yeah. Woo! Big claps for ice cream. Everybody loves ice cream. We are going to have like four different flavors of ice cream after service. It might be raining. If so, we're going to give it to you right at the doors. Make sure you get some ice cream uh, as we leave the service here today. Ice cream, you scream. We all scream for Yes, I already had mine, and now my belly's feeling it. Um, I'm a little full. So I'm very enthusiastic today to be talking to you about giving. <laughs> Here's the thing. When we give to a local church, whatever local church we are giving to, we are doing our part, if this is our home church, our part to support three big parts of the church, and it's these things. Everything in a local church budget falls under maintenance, ministries or missions so maintenance we have to pay our bills right you know we have a light bill we have electric bill all this kind of stuff that's just that's just a given but then we also as we give we are giving to support the ministries of the church the homeschool ministry youth ministry children's ministry ministries need financial resources to be able to do the things god's calling them to do but then any healthy church also has part of their budget a missions where from the money we God brings into the church, we then tithe 10% to help churches, ministries, and organizations to do the work that God is calling them to do. So, for instance, the, the Dominican Republic in helping to build this church, uh, ministry work that's being done in Peru, we've sent missions teams there. We support a ministry that's happening in Russia. We support Barnabas Project, which is helping the persecuted church across the world. We support Convoy of Hope, which goes into it to provide disaster relief when needed. And then right here in Frederick County, we have the Frederick Lo uh, local Frederick uh, Rescue Mission and Religious Coalition helping and supporting people right here in our own community. So when you give to FCF Church, you are also giving through FCF Church to help and support God's work in all these other um, areas. So good job. Good job, FCF Church. Way to go. And if you want to continue to give to the great things that God is doing in and through his church, as always, we invite you to give on our website, on the app, or utilizing the offering boxes. Pastor Randy is taking a much distur uh, disturbed, <laughs> deserved, that wasn't good. Sorry, Pastor Randy. Much deserved um, vacation time, getting some great rest. I know the Lord is strengthening him in this time, and I talked to him last week, and he's just doing great, and so I can't wait to see all the energy he brings back into the church after this time of rest. So Pastor Pete, one of my favorite people, is bringing us the message today. Now, does anybody know that he tends to tease me at times and do anything he can to embarrass me when he has the opportunity? right? Always pulling a prank on me. So the first service, I got him good, you guys. I was like, so, you know, turnabout's fair play. He always embarrasses me. So check out this video. And the look on Pastor Pete's face was priceless because he thought, what's coming? And it was just a joke. I didn't really have a video. But come on up here. I do have something else this service. <laughs> Since I was like, How, what do we do? Second service. So between services, some guys in the booth helped me, <laughs> and we really do have a video this time, yes. <laughs> no, I was just kidding. I had to do something. I had to do something. <laughs> I had to still get him. I was like, how do I get him second time? But I'm pretty sure one of these Sundays, there's going to be a Pastor Pete embarrassment video. Until now, though, today he's got a great message for us on contentment. <laughs>
morning. I will be, I think, the third person to welcome you to FCF. So glad you've chosen to join us. As Pastor Kim said, my name is Pete. I have the incredible privilege of serving here as the associate pastor, also a member of our teaching team. If this is your first time with us, we're so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. And following service, myself, some of our leadership team members, my wife will be over in Guest Central. We would love to shake your hand, answer any questions about the church, and just get to know you. So, FCF, can we show some love to our first-time guests this morning? As Pastor Kim mentioned, we have an incredible founding and lead pastor. Uh, great churches are the result of great leaders. Amen? And we have a great leader. Can you let Pastor Randy know how much you love him, how much you appreciate his gifting? Earlier this week, uh, Jessica and I went out with some friends. They're actually, they were, they were going to Italy. Before they left, we spent some time with them. And um, they took us to this, this, this fancy restaurant. It was, a, it was a fancy restaurant. Did I mention that? Um, I, I went in, we sat down, and, you know, nice tablecloth. The salad plate was freezing cold. So I'm a, I'm a missionary's kid, right? So this was, this was highfalutin for me. And... Uh, I asked the lady, I said, I said, what's good? She says, there's, there's four things, and they're all good. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Imply as though they weren't. They bring out the, the hors d'oeuvres, and they put them down, <laughs> and there's, there's two things on it. And I looked, I thought, man, that's delicious. I wonder what everyone else is going to eat. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and I'm hungry, and man, they... Waitress comes out and she puts this beautiful dish in front of me and I'm so hungry. I am incredibly excited. I'm just smiling ear to ear. I'm like, this is incredible. She gives everyone and gets to Jessica and, and then she puts Jessica's plate down in front of her. I looked at mine. I looked at Jessica's. Yeah, it looked really, really good. And all I could think of is, man, why did I get this one? I should have gotten that one. I'm sitting in a restaurant, air-conditioned in a comfy chair, where food is prepared and brought to me as I wait. And I wish I had what she was eating. Now, be honest. Be honest. Has this ever happened to you? So you say, okay, so I'm not the only sinner here. That's fantastic. <laughs> Whew, I was panicking for a second. I don't think it just happens with food, though. I think it happens in all different portions and parts of our life. Driving to church, north on 15, all of a sudden, traffic comes to a stop. There's, there's two, yeah, every day on 15. And there's, there's these two lanes, right? And this lane starts moving. And there's someone, they're like, I got it. I'm going to get in that lane. So they get in this lane, and then what happens? You've seen these people. Okay. <laughs> so then the other lane starts going. And you know, at this point, of course, what are they going to do? They switch lanes. And then what happens in that lane? So, you know this person? Are you sitting next to this person? Don't look at him. You could still have in trouble. Probably the most important question. Are you this person? Now, I'm strange in that I feel like if I can see the person's face, I might be able to understand what is rolling around inside the cabeza? Like, I'm going to be able to figure this out. And so I, want to, I don't want to say anything mean to them. I don't want to, you know, give them the Christian single. None of that. I just want to see their face. Any, okay, again, anybody else, you be honest. You want to see them. Okay, these are my people. All right, my people, my people. All right. So I'm driving to church one day, coming up 15. And there's somebody, and man, I'm telling you, they're left lane, right lane. They're cutting cars off. I can see, like, commotion inside the vehicle. And so I'm like, I, 
I got to see this person. Who is this individual? So I get in the left lane, try to kind of get around him, basically doing what they were doing earlier. And get up next to him. As I get towards the back, I see an FCF church sticker on the bumper. <laughs> I get next to it, and I can hear worship music blaring, and it's Pastor Kim. <laughs> All right, that's not actually true, but she made fun of me earlier, and that was not kind. But all joking aside, if you are this person, I feel like God sent me here this morning to tell you something. If you're driving and you're in traffic, unless you need to get off of the exit, be content in the lane that you're in. Everybody said? (laughs) No, my message this morning is on contentment. Turn with me to Philippians 4.10. We're going to start here. The context of this passage, excuse me, the context of this passage is that Paul planted this church in in Philippi of Macedonia about 10 years earlier. It's on the northern side of Greece. And they actually supported Paul for an extended period of time. But at some point, the giving dropped off. Not sure what had happened, but the church was going through something. And so Paul kind of picks up in that narrative right here. They send a care package to him to bless him. And this is where verse 10 picks up. It says this, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Verse 11, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have, what is it? Learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. Did it just jump over a slide for me there, Joshua? Never mind, here we go. Philippians 4.12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being, what's this? Content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or whole 30, whether living in plenty or in want. It doesn't really matter which study you read, you find that our culture is more discontent than it's ever been. I mean, we are diseased with it. It seems like intrinsic to our fallen human state. Forty years ago, our homes were a thousand square foot smaller and our families were bigger. And now we live in bigger homes with more amenities and statistics show that we are less satisfied. This morning, I want to start by looking at two common sources of cultural contentment. And the first one is this, possessions. Money and possessions are the most common cultural pursuit in our effort to acquire contentment. Luke 12, 2 says this, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of, what is it? This belief that, man, if I can get bigger, better, newer, nicer, bigger, better, newer, nicer, if I can get enough, I will be content. And trying to acquire money And possessions in an effort to be content is like trying to put out a fire with gasoline. It does not work. It gets worse. It gets worse. It gets worse. And you will wear yourself out trying to achieve contentment through possessions. Proverbs 23 says this, Do not wear yourself out to become rich. Be wise enough to restrain yourself. Solomon, one of the richest and wisest men to ever walk the planet. Keeping it real. Look what he says. Money, the more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. (laughs) Hashtag keeping it real. You're trying to keep up with the Joneses. Man, I just got to keep up with the Joneses. If I can, man, if I can get this and get that, then I'd, I'd be satisfied. I'd be good. I'd be content. The problem is the Joneses are on the verge of bankruptcy. The Joneses can't keep up with the Joneses. BBT and Truist can't keep up with the Joneses. 
Debt is an epidemic. It's consuming us. It's so dangerous. Just make 437 easy payments of $18. Bigger, better, newer, nicer. Bigger, better, newer, nicer. Oh, but just the easy payments. There's a deep, profound, philosophical, and spiritual truth. If the payments are so easy, pay cash. Get yourself into debt. The average American will spend over a quarter of a million dollars making interest payments alone. And it's worse on the East Coast. For a long period of time, the number one cause, the number one cause of divorce has been communication. It's been an issue for a while. You know, some of you know my, my degrees in counseling psychology. That's been the issue. Ah, but suddenly, a new winner enters the field. Money. New studies show that money is the number one cause of divorce. It used to be, till death do us part, and now it's, till debt do us part. And maybe you find yourself in this position where you feel like you're drowning. Again, we want to resource you. We want to help you. We have an incredible ministry called Financial Peace University. It's going to start in a couple weeks. One of our elders teaches it and some other people. In I think it's in two months it's going to start. So if you have questions on that, we would love to help you because debt will consume you and it will overtake you. It'll polarize you, paralyze you. Possessions are a means to an end. So I possess is highlighted. You know why? Because if you're not careful, it will own you. And we own them. They shouldn't own us. Now, I do want to be clear, because there's a lot of confusion when this is talked about. People start saying, well, money's not important. I I'm not saying that. I'm I don't want you to think that wealth is evil or money is bad or it's not important. None of that is the case. On the contrary, money is important. As Pastor Kim shared, it provides a utility. I've stood in this room and I've yelled, praise the Lord. But none of the lights came on until we paid the bill. <laughs> we run four small, excuse me, three small buses every Sunday morning to get people into this building to hear the gospel. Shout out to our transportation team, Miss Goodhart, <laughs> Neil, for helping coordinate, Scott for help maintaining the buses, and all of our drivers. You make a difference. Thank you. I've stood behind those bands and yelled, Hallelujah! But it ain't got no gas in it. Like, we got to put gas in the buses. No, money is an important tool. I also get frustrated when I hear people misquote Scripture and say, well, you know, the Pastor Pete, the Bible says that money is evil. Like, that's not what the Bible says. 1 Timothy 6.10 says this, for the, what is it? The love of money is evil. Lead you astray. Some people eager for money have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Remember I said it'll hurt you. You'll hurt yourself. Is it possessions? Is it possible to be wealthy and not materialistic? Yes. It is possible to be wealthy and not materialistic. How? I love this. I love that God gave us this perfect example. 1 Timothy 6.17 says this, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud, not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all that we need for our enjoyment. 18, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those who are in need, always being ready to share with others. There's four things. Don't be proud of it. Don't put your hope in it. Use it for good and share it with others. You, you want God's blessing? You want to feel like you're being faithful with God's blessing? Don't be proud of your money. Don't put your hope in it. Use it for good and share it with others. The Bible doesn't condemn wealth. The Bible condemns the love of wealth, the love of possessions. He opposes 
that. There are people in this room that realize how incredibly blessed we are and they see money as a tool. And many of these same individuals, that's why you invest in this church because you realize the impact that it has. During Christmas, um, we had an issue with one of our uh, piece of equipment, our soundboard. One of our mics wasn't working during one of our services and we had basically outgrown the console that we were using. We, the team grew faster than we expected and one of the individuals, hey, why wasn't this mic working? We explained that the mic had worked and didn't have a backup channel. And they said, uh, how much is the soundboard? And I told them, it was more than I made my first year in full-time ministry. And they said, wow, that's, man, that's a lot of money. Said, yeah. The wife pulled her laptop out of a briefcase, put it on my counter, and sent a check to the church for the amount. And I went over to her husband, who was beating up my children, and I said, I said, your wife just wrote a check for the soundboard. Are you okay with that? And this is what he said. He said, that's what money is there for. It's not my money. It's God's. That nothing would ever, yeah. That nothing would ever prevent the gospel from going forth. What is money? Money is seed. Come on, it's seed. Sow it wisely. Don't plant your seed in something with no eternal value. Don't build possessions where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Nothing will have more eternal impact than when you invest in the kingdom of God. Amen? That's why we send, yeah, that's why we send people. That's why we have missionaries. Because you can't take money with you, but you can send it on ahead. I can't wait for the day when we get to heaven and we get to see the incredible impact that FCF Church as a family had on the kingdom of God. The lives that were changed, the hope that was found as a result of the investment people in this room. And just, just I'll, I'll just clarify something really quick. So we mentioned finances twice here. The church is in a stronger financial position than it's ever been in. This is, this is not us trying to get money from you because we need it. We are blessed. We are blessed. This is something we want for you. We want, we want God's very best. And if, and if money has a hold on your life, you will never, ever, ever find contentment. But when you partner with us, we at FCF, you've noticed this about our incredible lead pastor. He doesn't feel convicted by culture. He doesn't care what anybody thinks. He feels convicted by the word of God, and we take flack for it. We take flack for our belief on Christian sexuality, and we don't care. We are bound to the word of God. Amen? Yes. And when you partner with us, that message goes further, faster. The first most common pursuit is possessions. The second is positions. This is the belief that success and achievement and personal accolades lead to contentment. Man, if I just had that job, if I was in this social group, if I was at this company, if I could get this award, and then I would be happy. But here's the problem. Success is defined in culture by how many people you lead and how much money you have. And this will never lead to contentment. But God says, how many people do you serve? How much are you giving away? God doesn't need anything from us, but he wants to break the cycle of greed that is natural to us. Why don't you turn with me to Mark 8.31 if you're taking, still use a Bible or on your phone, whatever you use. 
The context here is that Jesus has fed the 5,000. He's performed miracles. He's had the 4,000. He walked on water. And he has just affirmed Peter as Peter acknowledges that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, I'm going to build my church on you, Peter. That's where we pick up here. Mark 8, 31. It says, then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must, what is it? Many terrible things. And be, what is it? By the elders, the high priests, and the teachers of the law. He will be, what is it? Come on, what is it? But three days later, he'll rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter, what's it say? And reprimanded him. Do you, do you see what's going on here? Jesus is teaching. I can't help but do this because it's, I picture these stories in my head working in a church, but Jesus is teaching, and he's like, mm, 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 Jesus. Yeah, 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 come on over here. We'll be back. What's that, guys? He's like, um, this whole, like, suffer and death and hardship vibe, I guess it's not a good look. You know what? It's kind of killing morale. You know I mean, we got, a, we got a good thing going here. Crowds, they're here. Judas says money is up, you know? And then it, sa it says, Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples. So he's over here talking with Peter, and he's looking at Peter. What? Then looks back at his disciples. And he clarifies something for Peter. It says, get away from me, Satan. He said, you are seeing things merely from a point of view, not from God's point of view. Then calling the crowds to join his disciples, he said, pause. See, Peter didn't like the fact that Jesus was saying that he was going to suffer. He wasn't going to rise to this position like everyone thought he was going to. He says, no, I'm, I'm really going to do something incredible. You ready? <laughs> I'm going to suffer and die. But what he didn't realize is that was the same thing that Jesus was going to call his disciples to. Let's look. If any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. The only reason you pick up a cross is if you're dying. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. I'm well, right here, verse 36. Take and Write in your Bible, circle this. Your Bible's too good to write in, throw it away, get a Bible you can write in, circle this verse. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? Anything more valuable than a man's soul? You can achieve whatever accolade you want. It will not make you content. This is from a Christian perspective. We're looking at this. But even from a secular perspective, this doesn't work. This is, this is the American model. Many of you have seen it. I'll show it to you. It looks like this. In the first half of your life, you give up family and health for success and for money. In the second half of your life, you give up money and success to try to get your family and your health back. I could say it another way. In the first half of your life, you give up family and health for, what is it? And in the second half of your life, you give up possessions and positions, fighting to try to get your family and your health back. Listen, you can win the rat race. You're still a rat. Going round and round on a wheel. Solomon says you are 
chasing the wind. And the faster you run towards it, the farther you will be from it. It will not satisfy. Do you know why it won't satisfy you? Do you know why every rock star that finally melts down realizes no matter what you achieve, you were made for more? There's something in you that will only be satisfied in a relationship with Christ. Your heart knows it. The danger with positions and possessions is that they're relative and comparison-based. 2 Corinthians 10 tells us this. We don't dare compare ourselves. It's not wise. Don't compare. But we do, because comparison is America's favorite indoor sport. Man, look at them shoes. Them shoes are fancy. Man, I wonder what those things cost. God says, don't compare. He says, don't covet. It's in God's top 10 list. Right up there with don't murder. Maybe thinking, oh, God, wet blanket won't let us have any fun. No, God knows that a covetous heart will destroy you. It will rob your contentment. You will never satisfy it. It's an unquenchable thirst. We need to learn to admire without the desire to acquire. Man, that's nice. I like that. That's a fancy shirt. That's a good-looking shirt. I don't need it. It's also a girl shirt. Shouldn't wear it. I'm going to let that joke, I had my head go right past, and I'm going to touch that next one. Desiring a wife, Scripture says, is a good thing. Desiring your neighbor's wife is a bad thing. Contentment is found not in, excuse me, contentment is not found in our possessions. Contentment is found in God's provisions. Contentment is not found in our positions. Contentment is found in God's plan and God's mission. I'm going to go all the way back to where we started, Philippians 4.12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have, one more time, give it to me. I have learned. Would you like some good news? It's a little heavy this morning. Would you like some good news? Anybody? Okay. It can be learned. I mean, we think this is a personality trait that we're born with, but it's not. Paul is saying this is a disposition that you can develop. And don't feel bad if you don't know it. Do you know why? He says a lot of people don't know it. Paul feels content and at peace while sitting in a jail cell. I have learned the secret. And God will often call us to demonstrate an emotion that contradicts the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Paul is more content in a prison cell than some of us are when our Wi-Fi is slow. So how do we do this? How do we achieve this? It can be learned. So how do we do it? Philippians 4, 9, Paul says, put into practice all that you've seen me do. I think this is the first piece in it. Is this whole concept of chasing contentment will never work. But you practice it. Practice it. How do we practice it? I'm going to give you seven keys to contentment. And these, as I look back through my life at different points in my life, I'm like, man, that's what this was. I think this can help you. The first is you've got to recognize your source. Philippians 4.10 says, Rejoice greatly in the Lord. Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord. Always. His source was there. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. Press into him. The greater your intimacy, the greater your contentment. The closer you get to God, the farther you will get from being discontent. 
going to share a story I didn't share in, in first service, but I remember uh, it was probably about seven, eight years ago, I, I was helping pastor another church, and <clears throat> we had gone through kind of a challenging time in the church. The church was growing, but I kind of ended up with, with like more responsibility than I thought I was ready for, and it was a, just a challenging time for me. And I was down front after service uh, talking with some people and praying with some people, and, and then um, they had kind of walked away, and this, this sweet lady, her name is Miss Robin, Miss Robin came up to me, and she was like, hey, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm doing good. It's, you know, it's just, it's just challenging, and navigating all this is, you know, but I just, right now, I'm just in a season where I feel like I'm just, I'm just holding on to God, that, that he's, just, he's just all I have right now. Like, he's, he's all I have. And she smiled real big, and she said, and don't forget, he's all you really need. And she walked away. Come on, sometimes we don't even have the opportunity to realize He's all we have until he is all you have. So if you find yourself right now going through it, I want to encourage you. He can sustain you. He can be your source. Second point is this, recognize your season. You may be thinking, man, I'm called to this. I'm supposed to be doing this. I want to be over there, but I, I'm not there yet. Enjoy where you are on your way to where you're going. And don't compare your sowing season to someone else's harvest season. You shouldn't be comparing at all. Three reasons I think we don't get what we want. Three most common reasons. Or first of all, we ask for the wrong thing. It's not the right time. It's not the right season. Or... And God has something so much better for you. And listen, when he has something that is better for you and he wants you to get it, nothing in all of creation can stop him. Amen? Come on, he will sustain you. He has to be your source and he will meet you in your season. This one, this next one, people don't like to talk about. You ready? Recognize your sin. And we're fallen. We're broken. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This was the point I realized, oh man, I think that means me. Living for pleasure or fun, living for pleasure or for fun is just going to last you a season. but then you will become discontented. You will be miserable. We can't live this life outside of God's will and expect to be content. Recognize your sin. Come on, this one's, we're getting encouraging now. Recognize your stop. This earth is not your home. Your destination isn't here. You will never fully be satisfied in this environment. You could be on a vacation in a tropical location with the love of your life, enjoying, man, it's just the greatest thing in the world, and a fly will come and land in your soup. <laughs> we, we have this, this desire for perfection because God put that in us because that is what heaven is going to be like. When I say, you hear me say all the time, the best is yet to come, I'm not talking about 27, I'm 26 now. I'm not talking about 27, I'm talking about heaven. Amen. <laughs> David says it this way, Psalm 17, 15. But as for me, my, what's he say? Is not in wealth, but in seeing you and knowing that all is well between us. And when I awake in heaven, I will be fully satisfied for I will see you face to face. This earth is not our home. I gave you four things to recognize. I'm going to give you three things to remember. The first is remember to rejoice. Remember Philippians 4.4 4 says rejoice in the Lord. Come on, he's our source. Always 
And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. He says it twice. Why does he say it twice? The ladies are like, well, he's probably talking to a bunch of men, and with men, you always have to say it twice. <laughs> you guys are never listening. And to that, the men would reply, what'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he says it twice because we forget. We forget. Contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want. It's the realization of what you already have. We forget how blessed we are. We are so blessed. And we take it for granted. A buddy of mine was buying a go-kart from somebody, and he showed up to pick up the go-kart. And this is a, the, the man that was, bu- that was selling it was a man with a wife, children, working a job. And he shows up to get the go-kart, and the pull cord was removed from the flywheel on the side of it. And he says, you didn't say there wasn't, you know, a pull cord on this. The guy's like, oh, no problem. He pulls it out of his pocket, wraps it around the flywheel, and starts it. And the guy's like, you know, these are pretty inexpensive. You could, you know, get one and slap it on. He said, no, this is how I was driving to work, and this makes it harder to steal. Now, we take for granted so much of what we have because we compare. We got to rejoice. We got to realize how blessed we truly are. Now, if I were to be honest with you, which I try to be, this is the one that I've struggled with the most in my life. I'm I'm an Italian, and we feel deep. Mm. (laughs) There have been times in my life I could tell you story after story of how I was hurt, and you could tell me story after story of how you were hurt. They did. They they didn't treat us right. They hurt us. They did mean things, vindictive things. This is going to surprise you, but even Christians, sometimes churches, but we have to forgive. And forgiveness isn't saying that what they did was okay. Forgiveness is just saying, you know what? I'm going to be okay. God is going to help me navigate this and I will get through it. You have resentment over here and you have contentment over here. You don't get both. They are, it's a sliding scale and they are mutually exclusive. You got to pick one. Now, all of these keys, to be honest, they're helpful. You can use them in your head to think about what you're navigating, but the truth is this last key that I'm going to give you, it trumps all of this. In your humanity, navigating where you are, these points might serve as a resource. But what I'm getting ready to share is the number one key to contentment. It's all that really matters. Start by reviewing. Recognize your source. It's got to be Christ. Know the season that you're in. Get right with God. Come on, you can't live in sin and be content. You won't. It will eat you up on the inside. Recognize your home. Forgive. Rejoice. And then finally, remember the mission. And this, this, is, the whole, this is the whole deal. The, the, devil, the devil doesn't have to make you fall away from your faith. All he has to do is keep you off mission. All he has to do is keep you distracted. Keep you focused other places. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says this, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is what? Unseen. Since what is unseen is temporal or temporary, but what is, excuse me, what is seen is temporal. What is unseen is eternal. Man, this is what matters the most. This is what we have to hold on to. Contentment is found in the realization that this life is temporal and your purpose here 
is missional. Contentment is found in the realization that this life is temporal and your purpose is missional. See on your program, this is your last fill-in, says this, personal contentment is found in missional fulfillment. You, you can be in a war in Baghdad, Iraq with bullets flying over your head. But if you know that you're in the center of God's will, He will give you contentment. And this soldier picture is one that's so clear because I, it's hard for me to imagine a soldier in the middle of a war saying, you know, I thought we were staying in the Hilton tonight. Looks like tents. No, the AC is not, I prefer a less balmy environment I thought my steak was supposed to be medium rare. This is medium well. Send it back. No, a soldier knows the mission. He is laser or she is laser focused on what the orders are. And when you develop that kind of missional focus, bam, there's contentment. I'm not pursuing this. I'm not pursuing that. I'm not chasing possessions. I'm not chasing positions. I'm learning and practicing contentment. I am missional in my focus. Would you like to hear what personal contentment, missional contentment sounds like? Acts 20, 22. This is a real man that is writing this letter. Went through incredible challenges in his life. And he refused to compromise. He refused to back down. And he had missional contentment. This is what it sounds like. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, my life doesn't matter. I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim, my only aim is to finish the race, complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. That's what, that's what. Contentment found in missional fulfillment looks like. God, I pour myself out as a drink offering for you. That I would decrease and you would increase. That your purpose be established no matter what. I don't care about anything else. I don't care about bigger, better, newer, nicer. I want your will and I want your way. And God, I am focused on testifying to the good news of God's grace. That that would be our heart's cry. That that would be our desire. That nothing, nothing would stop us. Would you stand to your feet with me? Heavenly Father, God, we pray that we would have the mindset that Paul had. We wouldn't fix our eyes on what is seen. We would focus on what is unseen. God, the eternal. God, that even now as we share our faith, God, that we would hear heaven rejoicing. God, when people come to you and we're fulfilling our mission, they are cheering us on, a great crowd of witnesses, that we would see your will, your purpose, and have missional fulfillment as our means of contentment. God, you are more than enough for us. You are so faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you say this with us? God, you're more than enough. 
church let's sing it together no matter what the circumstance come on see it just like that lift your voices to him As a way of us putting our trust and our commitment in Christ I want to sing this one more time I'm actually gonna ask the band to be quiet just have Leo play and can we just as a sign of showing God you are all that we need can we lift our voice to and sing it come on sing it with us Are you guys content with that message? It is amazing. Don't we love Pastor Pete? Pastor Pete is fantastic. Thank you so much. What a wonderful message this Sunday. We are so glad that you are here with us. We have ice cream on the way out when you exit. There are four different flavors. Get some ice cream, have some great fellowship, spend some time with people. If it is your first time and you'd like to meet Pastor Pete, spend some time, talk to him. We would love for you to go meet him exit through Guest Central. And if you need someone to spend some time and pray with you this morning, we'd love for you to exit through Care Central. Have a wonderful Sunday.